All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It's your host with the most, Terrell Simmons, and welcome to another episode of Rise Penors. I got my boy K Mo in the building. I'm yeah, gonna give you the bio and all that stuff earlier, see it in the notes. But man, this brother, he is amazing, doing some amazing work. Hey, you know what? Let's get to the journey of how we even met. How did we? I, I want to get into that real quick. How did we first meet? I, I, I'm I'm thinking it was through Shola, but how was the initial connection that we met? If you could uh, rejog my memory. She told me that she had a brother she wanted to connect me to. And I'm, I don't know, did we do a Zoom call the first time or was it a conference oh, call? Yeah. Just like a three-way call? It was a Zoom call. She's like, oh, you got to meet this young brother. But was it the was our first call about Trap House? I don't even remember because I know you yeah, do a couple different things. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Uh, and, and I heard about the work you was doing over there in Trap House. And I was like... And this is a this is an African brother too. I was like, hey, but what, what's he doing all the way in Ohio? Wait, how did you get to Ohio? I don't even remember that story. Oh, it was really a wild story. Um, I don't have any connection to my father's side of the family. Okay, uh, we don't even have a connection to him. So, uh, I mean, really, the reason I got to entrepreneurship is because he actually stole my college money to go to school. So, <laughs> but, like, I have no. Like, really, I don't know that side of my history. You know, I only know yeah. this side of my history, you know, on this side of the pond. So, you know, I am detached in that regard from, like, I don't know my grandfather's name. Like, I just actually really asked my mom recently. I'm like, you know, hey, do you know my paternal grandfather's name? And she was like, no. She was like, you know, your grandmother said he may have been up in Detroit or something like that, but mm-hmm. I don't have pictures of him. I don't know what he looks like. This man walked up to me today and said, if you can tell me who I am, I'll give you $10 million. I would not have the foggiest who he was. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and, and then, like, now correct me, is, it, is your, your dad's side, is that the, the African side or is that the American side? So they're both, you know, as far as I know, they're both African American. I don't know, like I, it would be my dad's side, but I don't know where it, like the the breakdown came in at. They. I really don't have like I've never had a conversation with him about my lineage. Like I mean, and then probably he lives in Cincinnati, forty five minutes down the road from me. I've probably seen him in person eight times, nine times. They. I don't have any connection to his side. What's I don't know. Like yeah. I'm really, I'm trying to do like I just did an ancestry.com thing, and tried to find you know my granddad on there. I couldn't find it on there, so I'm like you know I'm gonna have to really try to dig in and do some work because there's a whole and I don't know my mom's grandfather either or my mom's father. I don't know either. I've never seen either one of my grandfathers. Don't know their names. Like so, it's really you know a weird situation. But I'm trying to figure that out now because I'm starting. You know to- that, that that's an interesting. Uh, thing because that, that that's something that I struggle with as well because my my dad's side I met him like a handful of times five times don't really know that side of the family uh, I was raised by my stepdad who's Nigerian and uh, possibly maybe know more about his family side of the family than I know my my biological side I was raised in that environment know my a little bit about my mom's side but we don't keep in touch to to the degree of history and. And and despite all that, uh, without knowing our roots like that, we're both be successful in our lives. Uh, you know that that's an, a testament to how how creative, how resilient we are as a people. To to me, not yeah. knowing our history and lineage, and still be able to to grow and and still represent the way that we do. With that exactly. Nation. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. Um. So let's let's dive right in because I, I I know you. I want to talk about the concept and the birth of. Trap House. Well, first, for the people who don't know, what is Trap House? And and then how did this idea come to be? Okay, okay. Trap House, you know, people have asked me, like, you know, they mistake your Trap House. Um, <laughs> I would have did the same thing, honestly. <laughs> it was meant to, you know, kind of elicit that type of response to where people are like, did you just say Trap House? And it's like, no, I did not. But I'm glad that, you know, you're listening because it's Trap House and it's meant to be a play on Trap House. And Trap is an abbreviation or a slang term for entrepreneur. Um, back in the early 2000s, late 90s, like trap, trap, like calling somebody a trap was in vogue. Like that was the slang at the time to say you were an entrepreneur. People didn't want to say the whole word. So they just shortened it and said, hey, that person's a trap or they're trapping or whatever. So I saw that, you know, kind of clicked. Like, why don't we flip that? Because in my own experience, I've been able to take my upbringing in, you know, the hood, the disadvantaged community, and really take those lessons that I've seen, you know, those entrepreneurs in our community that are on the other side of the coin, the illicit side of the coin, and really be able to say, like, there's something that that's valuable there. There are a lot of people diminish. They don't understand 
the first angel uh, investors and VCs in the black community for most young black boys is, you know, drug dealers is, you know, yeah. black black men who are in the criminal enterprises. So I'm like, we all aspire to be that. A lot of them talk about transitioning from like, you know, that to rapping or hooping or whatever their transition was. And so you have a lot of young brothers who like, you know, I want to rap or I want to hoop. And I've noticed a lot of them, even with that, they still have a benevolent like community development mindset. And so I'm like, you know, their hearts are still there. but They're like, this is the only option that I've seen that I've been exposed to that I have access to that realistically has a potential to get me out of like just the drudgery of, the nine to five, like they're seeing their parents do that. And it's like, that doesn't work, you know, and they're, they're seeing people who don't have jobs. It's like, that doesn't work. And it's like, this is the only thing that I've seen work mm-hmm. in our community. So I'm like, I don't want to completely dismiss because they are entrepreneurs. Like we cannot yeah. dis, you know, diminish that fact. It's just that the products and services that they're selling are the incorrect ones. Yeah. And, and, and I'm so glad you mentioned that because it, if you could turn a, a, a drug deal into uh, and, and give them a, a great product and service and take that same mindset and flip it, there'd be some great businessmen. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's the, you know, part of the reason, and though we're doing it in two different formats, the, the main reason for me creating Rise Panor is because when I was out there speaking to the youth uh, about jobs, careers, doing workforce development, I, I noticed that we had this mindset. The only way we can get out there is like through these different entities and through this process. I've met so many amazing, brilliant black people in different spaces of community, education, business, just doing great things. And I wanted to highlight people like yourselves so that. You know, it's often that we can't be what we can't see, right? Yes. Uh, and so, since they haven't seen uh, like any other black people, or or they maybe only see one, and they think that's a fluke. Oh, that's the only one, right? And yeah, this yeah, is the only an one we get that. It's a, it's an anomaly, right? One to, uh, one to show more of us and our brilliance is creating, for lack of better terms, dope shit. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. Now, tell me about the the actual product and concept of Trap House. What is it? What is this 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 platform or this thing or this entity program? What is it? What is Trap House? <laughs> so, you know, pre um, the beginning of the end of the world, you know, it was meant to be an actual physical space. Okay. Uh, leading up to like literally the weekend when everything got locked down that following week, I was already slated to submit like three LOIs for three different spaces to build, you know, a, con- a container, shipping container based building that would look like the logo for Trap House to be our, you know, facility. And it would be a super hub that would act as an anchor institution, you know, in an urban corridor, you know, known as Salem Avenue here in Dayton. So it was like, okay, we have this urban corridor, you know, super hubs are all the rage as far as like being able to take and bring in innovation, bring in commercialization, so on and so forth and completely change communities. So I need to have a super hub smack dab in West Dayton, which is, you know, of course, predominantly black, um, disadvantaged, you know, left out, has all these different instances of greatness, um, like the, uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar's house is on the west side of Dayton. The Wright Brothers' house is on the west side of Dayton. Uh, the funk, you know, the whole funk era, you know, was really based in Dayton. Like we have a museum, a funk museum here. So there was a lot of greatness in this side of town, but it's always been this struggle. Yeah. And I'm like, I really need to have something that, you know, becomes that kind of a legend, like on a legend on the map, it becomes like one of those uh, waypoints where people know to stop, almost like the green book. Um, for black, you know, travelers, but for black business owners, where it's like, I know I can go here and it's black and brown, but I know I can go here and get whatever I might need one way or another to, you know, progress in my venture. So it transformed after the COVID situation into a virtual platform. And so now, you know, we have, you know, what I call the Trep House YO University, um, which is the curriculum. You know, we have several courses, not only self-serve, but, you know, live workshops that we'll be hosting. We also nice. have a mentorship network that lets us bring mentors into the fold who are experts in their own respective industries. And they can, you know, charge by the minute or they can, you know, opt to not charge anything, you know, based off of like what their engagement is, how they want to engage. And then we have a vendor's marketplace, which lets the different uh, vendors, products and service providers providing resources for black and brown founders who are black and brown freelancers and remote professionals themselves, such as marketers, accountants, you know, lawyers, corporate lawyers, so on and so forth, they can bring their services onto the platform and create a marketplace of these service offerings for venture development. Exactly. Um, we have an auto scoring mechanism where you can come in, we ask you a few questions, and based on that answer, we can look at seven business metrics and say this is the rating for Trap House or for your business based off of Trap House's, you know, measure. And this is what some of the things you might want to consider working on as you go through the venture development process. And if you do so, it makes you, you know, 
continually, increasingly more qualified to get an investment from Trap House directly or through one of our partnering, you know, investors, you know, funds, et cetera. So really building this in the end service um, or set of services in a single location, bringing this out of the physical into the virtual world, a super hub that offers, you know, the knowledge base into things, the mentors and advisors, you know, the different uh, resources that you need, you know, from like the marketing center, core competencies, as well as funding nah. um, to really start to cover that gap. And then we have a community that allows the founders and all these different stakeholders to kind of convene in one space to really build, you know, that black and brown startup ecosystem online. I love it. I love it. And you know what I love about it is because we build a community with, with us, for us, by us, and, and, and and it, and and that's what we really need when you talk about going into business and really understanding it cuz i think the things that we run up against as you know black founders or people of color are maybe a little different from our, our counterparts right um when we're trying to navigate this space what some things that have come up for you and what you see that comes up for um people when they when they get into entrepreneurship or business or scaling um, uh, of course, you had to pivot, right? But like, what's a, what's a couple key things that you could speak on? Let's start with yourself. That came up with yourself, but then other things you see um, from developing this this platform. Yeah, um, absolutely. So being um, pliable and being flexible, you know, being having the grit, you know, and the creativity, like those different, you know, kind of principles or values or you know characteristics, like those things for me are the most important things because an idea is a very small sliver of the totality of a venture. Um, but it really is like, you know, who's going to endure the longest, you know, everybody talks about, you know, it's a marathon. Yeah. I was a distance runner in high school. Like I did the, the events that people didn't sit and watch like the 3,200, the 6,400, the 1,600, the 800, you That's know, I, good I, lungs. <laughs> I had lungs, man. So it was like, but no nobody about to watch you run 16 times around the track. So <laughs> I had to realize at a very, you know, early age, I'm not really doing this for all the, you know, the uh, accolades, you know, and all the cheering, like the hundred meter dashes are pointing. There's no knock to sprinters or, you know, the middle distance runners, but I'm like, I would be running those 16 laps out there by myself. And not even my mom's was watching the whole race. <laughs> you know, it's like, you, it's like watching NASCAR, unless you're in the NASCAR, it's like watching NASCAR. So hey. I'm in that position where it's like, okay, my points count just as much as the dude who just ran one straightaway. Yeah. <laughs> but it, you know, am I going to go even less hard because I don't get the same glory? And it was like, no. So I would be out on the road alone. You have to run exponentially more than the 6,400 meter to be competitive in the 6,400 meter. So I'll be out there alone because it was like, you know, black dudes don't do distance. Like, bro, getting some hurdles or long jump or high jump or something. It's like, this is what I'm good at. You know, same with wrestling, which is another endurance sport. Um, but something else that kind of was a distinction that I didn't figure out in the totality of the sport and the things is like you hear people say athletes make great potential entrepreneurs and salespeople. But I read an article this summer that was saying there's a difference between subjective athletes and objective athletes. Uh, subjective athletes are basketball, football, team-based sports where you can have the best game of your life personally. You all can still lose a championship, though. Wow. Whereas an objective athlete, if you go out there and get your ass smacked on the mat or on the track or on the, you know, the tennis court or like wherever you're just, just you and that opponent, you have nobody to blame but yourself. You can't put it on anything or anyone but yourself, you know, in your own oversight. So it puts you in a certain state of like responsibility, hyper responsibility, where it's like I can't afford because I don't have the team there to back me up. You know, if I'm getting jerked around on this, man, they can't come out there and jump in like a Royal Rumble. Like this ain't <laughs> you know, like this isn't that type of wrestling. So I got to do what I got to do out here on this mat, man. So or on the track. So I learned like, OK, I didn't really realize how important that was. But, you know, it gave me a difference in uh, my ability to endure uh, in comparison to a lot of my, you know, our peers. And it's like I, I didn't understand that difference because it didn't it didn't seem hard to me. I never realized I translated those skills over. But once I started doing more research, like what why does it seem like, you know, there's a difference in the way that, you know, people are like, oh, this is great. And how you, and I'm like, it's not that hard. You just see it through. Yeah. Some days are going to be dark. Some nights are going to be bright. But. You have to. That's that's the game. Who's can outlast who? Like they, really you know, I, I, I think endurance is one of those things that either you have or you don't. Like, can can somebody learn endurance? Like, how can. you have to be willing to subject yourself to like you know like really extreme training? Like, uh, I watched on anime, and I was just right before you know earlier this morning, right before you know we hopped on our calls watching one, and you know they were uh being the the main characters were being pushed beyond their limits to the point where they were basically about to black out, lose consciousness and, you know, die. Right. And the anime, they run out of oxygen using fire, you know, powers, 
then they run out of energy and they can literally die from burning up their own life force. But their coach or their mentor was trying to push them beyond that point. He said, beyond the breath of life is the press of death. And like really knowing that death is breathing down your neck and that, you know, you have nowhere to go and you have to like, it's that fight or flight. You know, it's the difference in whether you're going to run from it or you're going to be like, yo, this is going to have to take me out. But like, I can't, I can't be the one to die today. So I'm not going to take you out. Like, <laughs> we have to almost have that kind of, and it's not a cockiness. It's just like, I cannot afford to stop here because the mission, the vision is so much bigger than me. And that's how I felt with Trap House through COVID. You know, it's been a three or four year process to get to the point where I'm about to launch. And for a lot of people to have COVID happen and be right there about to submit LOIs, you know, they would be like, I don't know what to do here. Within two weeks, I'm like, I already had plans to be virtual. It's like a um, second phase of Trap House's evolution. I just invest the whole process where it's like, instead of being physical first and virtual second, I'll be virtual first and physical second. And, and within two weeks of COVID happening, I was already, I'd already, you know, chosen how I was going to set the platform up. I mean, things were already there and it was like, oh, there's just, there's no problem to pivot. But a lot of people aren't, willing to like, you know, ask questions, you know, statements that down the mind, close the mind and questions open up the mind. And I've always been that, you know, well, what, how else could I do this? Or what other way is there? Who else can I hit up? Like I'm always going through the resources, like, you know, and if I don't have them yet, where are they at? Because the internet makes it where you have no excuses. That, you know, and that speaks to two other things that I think sometimes people forget is, you know, market research and not being afraid to pivot. Sometimes people get so stuck on their one idea and so passionate about their one idea. They don't realize that there's an opportunity to really uh, shift here to evolve your idea to uh, meet the needs of the market or become a better overall product or service. Right. We don't have that space in the community, though. Like, we don't, we are so critical when we things don't work out because people are already like, it's not going to work. So you can't, it's hard to come back to your own family and friends, your, you know, to your other, you know, even your kids would be this, you like, man, that's whack, man. Like, you know what I'm saying? But we don't have those people be like, yeah, bro, yeah, you should pivot, man. Maybe I'll sit down with you and help you do, go through ideation. Like, we don't do that in our culture. It's like, man, look right. at this. Yeah, the I'm black so community is especially hard. They're like, man, uh, <laughs> nah, you last time you, you went oh for oh. I don't know if I'm I could rock with you on this one, man. Exactly, exactly. You should do something else, right? <laughs> exactly. exactly. Get a job, bro. Cut it out. Like you know, we're trying to get some overtime. Bro. We're trying to stop <laughs> that. And it's like what. You know, that speaks to a lot of things, too, uh, with our community. Uh, another thing, oh, I'm going to pivot real quick for a second here, is, is, and this one is more for, like, those those young folks who are coming straight out of high school or college or still figuring out their path, because a lot of them think that, you know, oh, they tried one thing in high school and they can't do it no more, and they just go down this path of whether the counselor or teacher said, you're going to be a doctor, lawyer, whatever it is, and then they, they stay on this path not realizing that's not the right path for them. Or I, I see what I what I what I see people is when they get into their first job or or so forth, um, they don't take the lessons that they got from there and use them into their entrepreneurship journey or their career journey. Uh, and and although track and field taught you some lessons that you you've been able to apply in business, I want you to speak specifically to um, what was your first job and what was what do you think is the the one of the the good lessons you learned from your first job um, that you were able to apply in business or to that you took with you as, as a form of success to today when yeah. you do the work that you do. My first job, if you were talking about like, you know, first like W2 employee job, um, I was working as a busser at a restaurant called the Grub Steak. Uh -huh. um, I was probably two years old. That was like, you know, I was excited to be going into like, the workforce, you know, kids, as a kid, you're like, man, it's going to get a job and I get a check. I'm going to show you how to work this money. Like, y'all know what y'all have playing. Y'all have playing. It's an adulting part of this shit, man. So it's like, man, I got you. Watch when I get my first check. I'm balling out. Like, and then you get it and it's like, man, this is not, okay, I get why everybody's walking around all sad and they face <laughs> like, You know, it's like, hold on, man. I, I mean, there was people who was twice, three times my age who were not that much you know, further, and that's okay, but they weren't that much further, you know, along as far as like the hierarchy of the, the company than me. And I was, you know, as a kid, I was thinking like, is, is this like, how do, how do I stop here? I don't understand how I could stop here. Like for me, it was like, I've always, I've always been kind of a pusher. Like if I don't believe going backwards, that's one of my, my life models I say all the time. And it's like, so I learned that it is levels to this. And as a busser, you know, I was in there breaking my neck, you know, to make sure water stayed, re you know, stayed refilled. 
uh, making sure that the trays were coming out. You know, I was there when the waitress or waiter needed me, um, cleaning off the table, just all these things. And the waiters and waitresses were mostly older white folks. They and all the buses were mostly young black men um, for to sit there and hold these, you know, 30, 40 pound trays of food and all this stuff that's burning hot, you know, and refilling water while they on a smoke break. But then at the end of the night, you know, they're all giving you a ten dollar tip. And it's like you saw how hard I worked for the past seven, eight hours and you had the audacity to hand me a ten dollar tip. And I got to the point where it's like, man, you can keep it. And they were just like, oh, no, why are you being like that? Like, obviously, you need it more than I do. Yeah. <laughs> if you think that ten dollars. For eight hours worth of work, you know, you know, I'm getting paid minimum, not below minimum wage. I'm getting paid, you know, restaurant t- tiers rate wages, restaurant labor wages, which was at the time, like, I think, was it 215? This is like 2001. Wow. I think it was 215. Three, what was, it was something ridiculously low because they were expecting to make up on tips. And as a busser, we weren't getting minimum wage either. So we depended on the workers and waitresses for our tips. But, you know, we're, this was like a four star restaurant. So we're watching, you know, patrons leave fifty hundred dollar tips because these were all up to, you know, what to do white folks. And so it was like, OK, well, y'all are getting crazy tips. You all walking about here banking and you left me a ten dollar tip. Yeah. So it was just like, OK, you can work hard as heck and, you know, it still may not be appreciated. You know, I'm like, but at the same time, I didn't want to move up to being a waiter or move up to being a bartender or anything like that. I didn't want to work up to being an owner. Like, this is just, you know, a stop for me. But it taught me, like, you really have to be mindful. You have to work smarter and be mindful. So it got to a point where it's like, no, I can't go and refill waters while you go outside and smoke. Like, you paying yourself the tips you paying me, so you need to be here to refill their waters. Like, yeah. I got to a point where I started speaking up, whereas before, like, I had a problem. You know, because it was a thing in my household where it's like, you know, you weren't really allowed to express, you know, black black household, single black woman, she don't got no room for, you know, you even thinking that you have a backbone to stand up like you gonna flex. So yeah. it really diminished my voice to where that job taught me like, okay, you're going to have to really speak up and tell these people like, nah, it's not going down like that. And it just became increasingly easier. But that became a problem because it's like this black dude is always the one in the job that's not letting us run this bullshit as, you know, the white managers. And he's kind of like, you know, inciting this energy in other folks. Like, yeah. and so I was always an issue. I was always a problem in these companies. Is that what really ultimately left, led you down the path of entrepreneurship, knowing that, hey, you know, I don't think I could work for somebody because I, I don't want my voice and creativity to be, be stifled. Uh, I, I, and this is me putting words in your mouth, but what, what, what really led you down this path of entrepreneurship after, you know, being in the workforce? Um, it was actually preceding that when I was in high school graduating, the, the buster thing was just like, I know I was just working a job for high school to be able to go out and have, you know, my clothes for an up and coming turnabout or homecoming or whatever. But when I was preparing to like, you know, go into college, I got accepted to Tuskegee. And as I said, you know, my dad, total piece of crap, like total, total. But he started trying to act as if he wanted to come back into our lives, you know, the last couple of years of both my sister and myself's high school careers. Uh-huh. And so he was like, you know, I want to pay for whatever unmet need you have. Go ahead. I got you. Get the loan, you know, get the get get accepted in whatever school. And my job is going to give me an education loan. So I'll be able to just cover the unmet need. And so got, you know, except Tuskegee. You know, had my dorm assignment, class schedule, you know, had met my dorm mate, you know, had gone through talking to him all summer, just a whole line of things. And literally my mommy got in the rental car, packed it up, you know, we about, you know, tomorrow morning, talked to, you know, my dad. He's like, I'll be there 9 a.m. 9 a.m. came the next morning. No dad. Like, because they could, back then they cut the check to the parent in their name, even though it was an educational loan from his job. You know, you know not 10 a.m., no check. 12 p.m., no check. Next day, no check. Third day, no check. And so my mom was like, I guess you just enrolled at the local community college. Like, And all my other friends was going off to HBCUs, mm-hmm. you know, Kentucky State, Hampton, Tennessee State, uh, just like really Alabama a and Like everybody was jettisoning out. And I'm like, I'm getting stuck in this little, you know, this little basically this little industrial GM town. You know, I'll get my pops on my loan money. So that was like a wake up call where it was like, OK, I mean, I remember that third day. It was like, you know, like they talk about Jesus the Christ. Like, I, I felt like I had died. Like, cause it was just like, I can't believe this is happening. 18 years old, it was, it hurt so bad I couldn't feel the pain. Like, wow. just cause I couldn't imagine that, like, you know, this is really happening. Like, he's not incapacitated. Like, he's just really about to run with this check. Like, he knows I'm depending on this and this is really about to happen. So I remember thinking like, all right, I did the job thing with this grub state, you know, BS, that ain't it, you know, and. I got all, you know, ding there. All my cousins are out in the streets doing their thing, and I knew that that wasn't it. I'm like, 
you know, if I'm not going to school, you know, if I can't get in because I don't have financial aid, mom's credit is jacked up. You know, she don't have no money. So yeah. if I'm not getting out of my own cognizance, like it's not happening. So I'm like, so college ain't in this like, shit, what's the next best thing? And it was like, I keep, you know, I hear people say entrepreneur, but like, how the fuck did somebody do that? Like I kept hearing yeah. and I got what it was, but I'm like, how do you do that though? Like, where does that begin? And so that summer I ended up getting uh, invited to, you know, be a part of prepaid legal, you know, network, the network marketing organization. And the book they had us read was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And at that time, mm. 2003, it only, you know, been out like a couple years. And I read that and the light bulb went off and it was like, damn, this is it. Like, this is, this is what, what connects those dots. But in high school, I was going to like this organization with young black men at our high school where we had a mentor, Dr. Borka Twe. He was Liberian or he is like, he actually just moved back to Liberia after retiring. Uh, he worked at Sinclair, the community college I ended up enrolling into. But I met him during my high school time and he would come and meet with us two or three times a week just to kind of prepare us, you know, for what the world was about to be. Like he's like, you know, school, basically that same anime in the same episode I was just talking about, you know, there was a scene where, you know, the mom of one of the main characters said, you know, school's an aquarium. You know, there's a whole ocean out there and other aquariums. You get to choose which one you want to swim in. Ooh. And so... That's what he kind of did for us was like, this is an aquarium. And I know this seems like this is four years is going to be forever. It's not. And then you're going to be put into something that none of these people here are preparing you for. So I want you to know what's coming. But he didn't do it in a preachy way. He did it in a way to where, you know, we were led to that knowledge ourselves. And we chose the dirty glass and the clean glass. And so out of that experience and then we risk that poor dad, I'm like, I want to use economics and, you know, and finance and like connect those two things with like the liberation of black and brown people. Like this is... Nice. That was a connection. At 18, I'm like, I want to be the financier of the revolution. I used to say it all the time. Like, I don't know what the fuck that means, but uh-huh. I know that's what I want to do. And so I'm like, if I can't go to school, I'm putting myself through my own MBA program by not only reading, you know, material on all these different topics, real estate, credit, um, the financial markets and small businesses or startups. I'm like, I'm going to actually put each one of those things into effect for you know two or three years at a time. And so I did that over 17 years, had a real estate investing business had a credit consulting business, you know, flipped my own real estate, built my own personal business credit up, had an IT business, had an e-commerce business. I mean, like I really went through the rows, um, learned Forex in 2005, have been dabbling in that ever since then, um, wrote a book on it. Like I just really immersed myself in each one of these categories for a period of time until I came to the culmination, which is technically Trap House. Like this is like my magnum opus from all that, you know, work and that commitment back in 2003. Yo, that was a beautiful story and, and, and segue and connection of how you kind of built all that together. I often say that, you know, for people to be mindful that the uh, of the education that they're receiving, because some of the best lessons I've learned in life wasn't in the classroom, wasn't in school. You could get an education outside. The best education is often outside of the classroom and they're, they're in books that is not even in the school system. So my Facebook and my LinkedIn all say the university I graduated from was University of Hard Knocks. Like, and I'm like, I'm not Ashamed to say, because I see my 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 peers who went to HBCUs, they like, you know, at the time it was like, damn, they was partying it up and doing their thing. And now that they're all out, they like, bro, for real, for real, this eighty, ninety thousand dollars worth of crushing debt is not really worth it. Like on the back end, like, I mean, I had fun and all that, but I'm paying like, you know, two racks a month and I'm never gonna pay these two loans off. And I'm like, damn. Hey, I, 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 I know that feeling. I'm, I'm in it. Um, and that's why when I, when I go back to talk to kids, I was like, hey, don't let school get in the way of your education. <laughs> they, they don't know what, they, what I mean by that. Because it's cool. they, they, they teach you to be a part of a system and structure and it's things you can learn, but don't let that get in the way of your education because there's other things you can learn if you if you uh if you if you woke enough to catch those nut capture those nuggets. <laughs> yeah, they expose them. I'm like, you know, my model with Trap House is like we have to provide exposure and access to, you know, these schools of thought, you know, these industry startups, real estate development, et cetera, for our youth to get into it. Because when they say, you know, I want to be a rapper or a basketball player, they're literally saying, like, I want the freedom that I associate with those things. Yes. So I have the resources, not only be good for me and my family, but also my community, because they'll oftentimes say, I want to feed the homes. When I've, I've gone to speak at elementary schools, I just did a, um, a kind of a one on one with the Office of Males of Colors uh, chapter here in Dayton. And the director asked me to speak to, like, you know, 50, 
middle school, I'm sorry, elementary, middle school, high school students, young black men about the importance of education, the importance of, you know, financial literacy and like the importance of entrepreneurship. And, you know, and that was one of the things I told them is like, I don't want anybody on here as far as, you know, the older adults who are here as the ambassadors to feel discouraged by what I'm about to say. But, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not just pressed on telling you to go to college. If that works for you, cool. But, they, you know, you have to make sure it aligns and you don't get caught up with the student debt, et cetera, and recognize that you can, you know, go to a trade school and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, you can decide to start a business and take that journey and there's nothing wrong with that. But just make sure you don't see that through like you would see through a four year degree. Know that that's going to be a four year journey, at least in that trade program or in the entrepreneurial endeavor before you start to really see traction. Don't think just, you know, it's somehow going to be faster because it's not a four year university. Like it's a reason the four year university is the model that, you know, has kind of proliferated across the board. Like it takes us four or five years to kind of become at least a, a black belt where it's like, you're just now ready to really start learning where we yeah. think like the cap, like, okay, I got the degree. I got the black belt. I'm out here. You know, Chuck Norris with an ass. So I'm sorry. Uh, Who's who's a who's a black? Uh, what's his name? Michael Jai White. Uh, Michael Jai White out here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I resonate with all that. So you know, we pivoted for a little bit. Let, let's jump back into the trap house. You, you told me some of the, the 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 things that you ran up against and the things you had to do to pivot. Now, as as somebody who's a consumer who who's excited about to join your platform, what's some what's some things that I can expect to see in the platform, and and uh, and uh, and the things that you know can help me start to build the foundation. I, I'm new to this entrepreneurship thing, or maybe I'm I had I kind of started a business, but I didn't have the right formality. What's some things that I can get from Trap House, and what do you see? Some things that a lot of people who are who join Trap house entrepreneurs or people who get in there you know love to do in there or the, the things that they they seem to need the most give give, give us the breakdown for sure for sure so chep house as a venture development organization is meant to bring all those business development needs to the table for a venture to like go through the process of developing into you know a full-fledged small business and eventually you know just a viable business established organization um, so our goal is to, you know, take wherever you are in your process, assess where you are, and then assist you in going and filling the missing, you know, gaps, you know, the different cracks, you know, and really getting like on a flat surface and then start to, you know, get that incline effect going on where, you know, you're seeing higher highs and higher lows. Yeah. I, I see. I, I just saw a pause real quick. How you... um use your your career uh redoing houses and so forth building that foundation getting the cracks i i, I see where you're going with this I, some of that working in your mind but go ahead go back to what you said <laughs> you know, you know, higher highs and higher lows that comes from trading that's the trading concept you know where like if, if the market's trending up it's considered to have higher highs and higher lows where the last high you know is higher than the previous high and the last low is ho- higher than the previous low and if it's down it's considered like lower highs and lower lows so it's like yeah you're gonna have those dips we know where the market is recatching this breath and whatnot. And the same thing with a business where you have those dips and it seems like, oh, no, I'm going down. And it's like this can be like the change of the trend or it can just be where, you know, you're catching like, like creating a new support level to now get the win to now, you know, rock it off to the next high. So that's mm-hmm. what you know, we want to move them towards like those higher highs and higher lows where it's like you're really seeing progression. Even on the, the lowest points, they're still higher than the previous low points. Nice. All right. I like that. I like that. So. What, what's the future of Trap House? What, 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 what's your vision? What are you, what are you taking this to? What do you see happening in the future? Uh, what's your your wildest dreams? Give give me the give me give me that vision for sure for sure. So the venture development side is meant to just be the pipeline, getting people to the table, you know, getting people developed in and whatnot. But then there's a startup studio component, which a lot of us in our community haven't heard. But it's a model that is tearing up the entrepreneurial scene. VCs, angel investors, accelerators, incubators are all pivoting to this studio model because of the metrics that are proving how much more viable it is to launch a venture out of a So studio. break that down. What's the studio model? For those of people who are listening that don't know, what's the studio model? So a startup studio is much like a music studio or you know production studio where you're producing albums or TV shows. Instead, you're producing startups. And they call it like parallel entrepreneurship where you can start one startup at a time um, and get it to a certain point for so many months. And then you literally pass it off to an independent management team and they take it on and it becomes its own separate entity outside of like, you know, your studio ecosystem. Mm. Um, You can do five at a time in parallel entrepreneurship capacity where, you know, maybe two of them take off and three of them fail. And that's expected in the studio. But more often than not, even the three that fail, 
you know, you lost very little compared to the two that are succeeding in that scenario. Mm. And you can take all the resources from those three and almost like compost, apply it to the two that are growing and help them grow even faster because they've already validated the market and you're at the scaling stage with them. And same thing, you jettison them out and you do it all over again. And so you're literally looking at what needs are there in the marketplace in any given industry. And, you know, how can we fill those needs by creating products and services to solve those problems? And then you literally create them. You have everybody in-house, just like you would to produce an album, you know, or, you know, create a TV show or movie. You have all those people in there to, to create a startup and give it the highest possible chance of succeeding. Mm, I like that. I like that. Um, and I think that's something that could definitely be a benefit in our community because it's like I, I feel like the communities we come from have studio models already. They just not they're not formally, legit, right? <laughs> they are formally set up, that, and that's what I'm seeing. Is like we're already in that space and how we move. You know, even like you know, when you talk about that trap house model, like you have everybody in there working their different parts of the whole operation. Yeah. And, with trap houses, like you have to have the marketing people, the accounting people, the legal people, you know, the product designers, you know, the strategy people, the graphic folks, like everybody has to be talking and working together for us to say, hey, we're going to create these ventures. And then even taking it a step further, because we're at a disadvantaged state as a people, you know, I'm creating it as a what's called a creative capital studio. So that's where the different stakeholders who are bringing their creative capital, whether that's in like a technical field or professional field like legal or accounting or it's graphics or, you know, uh, marketing, et cetera, they all get a stake in the ventures that we launch. So you have you're incentivized to take it even more seriously because I'm not just asking you to hold out, you know, for some equity in the short term. Like our goal is to get to an MVP. So we should start generating revenue and go, you know, move accordingly to validate the model and scale, et cetera. So not only do you get this equity play, but you can get paid along the way and we can provide these services as a whole to clientele as a, a group of consultants. So you're able to like really create these engagements where some people are coming to you and saying, hey, I just need marketing, accounting, and legal. Some people are coming to you and saying, hey, I got this venture. I need everything, but I don't want to do it alone. And we can act as an institutional partner where it's like, you know, we can literally be a God level investor because we can provide you everything that you would need to get this venture off the ground. Mm. If it lies with, you know, what, you know, our investor, you know, our studio thesis, if you will, which for us, is like the agnostic, you know, we don't care if you're at, you know, the, the beginning stages, never launched a startup. If you're a serial entrepreneur, if you're in the middle of a venture that you need to scale, you need to exit either way, black folks don't have, any support at any range of the venture development process mm. at all. There's nobody really filling that gap. We don't have a wide combinator in our community we can point to and say, you know, it's worth $10 billion, $50 billion. I'm like, we don't have that. We don't we don't have enough anywhere, not one institution like it, but the market is as large, according to Morgan Stanley, is $4.4 trillion with a TR run. So I'm like, if this is a blue ocean that vast, and, you know, we're talking about the world being an ocean, you know, we have to get out of our aquariums and learn to swim among Ooh. the larger, you know, range of like the uh, the aqua life. And I'm like, where I'm at, like, you know, if you get if you're in an aquarium, you can only grow so big. They've shown sharks that should be 20 feet that only grow to be two feet because of the size of the aquarium. Yeah. So it's like our minds are the same way. If we're in that aquarium, even if we're meant to be, you know, a great, you know, great white shark, great black shark, it doesn't there or a dolphin or a whale or you know whatever nature that we are in that ecosystem we don't have a chance to because we are stuck in our aquarium so i'm like this is a means for us to show you uh this is the the, the channel way into the ocean at large it's meant to be the central hub that pipes out from like the smaller tributaries and whatnot into the larger body of water yeah and that goes back to that that what we were talking about discussing earlier about uh limiting beliefs so you know i consider you a, a very inspirational brother what what inspires you like do you have like a favorite quote mantra like what inspires you hmm. um i have to say like you know the black and brown revolutionaries of our time um like for example on my phone Whenever I'm like, you know, oh, man, I'm tired. I don't feel like doing anything. I look at this. This is my phone background. Okay, this, what is that? It's a brother, you know, in bondage, you know, during slave times. Yeah. And it's like, you're not, you're not tired, brother. Like, you don't know what tired he is. And so that's the kind of thing that inspires me because I'm like, you know, we've been given gifts, you know, as far as like our ability to move the way we do now. We see how Robert F. Smith's, you know, exist. It shouldn't be one instance of that, but it like it lets us know it's possible. There was a time where that was inconceivable. And, you know, we would have literally given anything to have a modicum of like, you know, that achievement. And we have that opportunity now. So it's like I have to be going at it at all times. And it's, you know, really the same spirit you hear from our people that grit, you know, the same, thing with the, you know, that trap house model is like I'm. But in my mind, it's like we have to do entrepreneurship for the liberation of ourselves because it's the number one driver 
that's been shown to lift whole groups, whole cultures out of poverty. We've seen it happen in India. We've seen it happen in China. You know, we're watching it happen starting to begin on the continent. You know, it's really the drive, the main drive, the primary driver. And I'm like, we have to do this. And I can't see anything else being my focal point. And it has not been for a long time. And so I'm like, you know, Marcus Garvey could do this, you know, do what he did with the UNIA without, you know, Twitter and without, you know, uh, Snapchat, you know, QEP. And, you know, they were able to do what they did without uh, Clubhouse. You know what I'm saying? Like they were able to do these things when there was no technology. So I'm like, what excuse do I have? And in the day and time when people are going viral in mere minutes, why not now? Like, it, why were they able to achieve those things then? But we, it's like this. And I'm like, I'm, I refuse to accept that that's just be, supposed to be relegated to like, you know, some mythical type of like journey in the past. Like we can do this now. I, I love, I love all that. I, I want you to speak to that, that person who's stuck in a dead end job, that kid that who, uh, has, you know, been in the circumstances you've been in and, and, and doesn't see any way out. I don't have a hot, I don't have a hot 16. I'm not great at sports. Um, give me the three keys to your success and what things or words of wisdom and advice you would give to that person who's, who's looking to basically start anew, figure out a way. Yes, yes, yes. Um, one, being an eternal student. Books saved my life. Um, I grew up in one of the worst communities in Dayton, Ohio, at a time when, you know, we were rivaling. I mean, we still are kind of rivaling some of the larger cities as far as the per capita rating of murders and et cetera and other violent crimes. But, you know, it was like I, my mom used books to really give me an exposure to like a way of thinking as a generalist. I didn't even discover that was a term until last year when I discovered also in 2019, a startup studio was a thing. I was building this thing, didn't know what a startup studio was at the time, and then happened across the term. But then I had this ability to, you know, connect systems or understand systems. A lot of people felt like it was an amazing feat. And I'm like, I feel like it's only because I read so much. And I, my, just like if you exercise any muscle, I can walk on my hands down steps, but I've been walking on my hands since I was eight years old. Mm. So even at, you know, 35, I can still walk on hands, you know, walk on my hands down steps because it's a muscle. I started exercising. Now, would I start trying to do that at 35? I don't know, you know, maybe I'll push myself to do that, but you know what I'm saying? Like it's a muscle that I've exercised. And so in that, it's something that you can build up, but you have to have that, you know, being an eternal student and then the courage, like not being afraid to fail and knowing that's actually a part of the whole equation. Like I'm more into the scientific process of the startup, you know, thing than I am to like the money that I'm going to make. And a lot of people are kind of like that doesn't really gel up. I'm like, but really it does because if you make sure all those processes are tight, you know, and just like an experiment where you want to have like, you know, you don't want to have any uh, tainting of the, the results. You want to have a double blind study, et cetera. Mm-hmm. I'm going to play with a startup where I just want the startup to really just be good for the sake of being good and having an impact. So before impact investment was a thing, it was about community. And that would be my third thing, like always focus on things that are going to provide actual value and not trinkets. Don't think that it has to stop at T-shirts. You know, don't think that it has to stop at lashes. Like it's all cool to get into those things and to start, but have the courage to expand, to pivot, to figure out what are your actual internal and external assets and use them to your advantage because you've been blessed with a set of gifts that nobody else has the luxury of having a combination of and that only you can provide the value of to the world. And it's like, but how do you get to that? And don't diminish it because we oftentimes I feel with black people because our gifts aren't really nurtured. We don't have the, you know, nobody in the, the, the hood has space for that unless you're just, you know, hooping or rapping or the usual things that are get our attention. But outside of that, it's like if, you know, if you have a natural, like I had a natural inquisitiveness as a kid and it served me as an adult where like I'm always just asking questions. I'm so critical of the thinker about things. It helped me understand systems because I had to get to that lowest common denominator. Yeah. And so in like that eternal student piece, having the courage, and uh, being willing to pivot, like we'll be willing to let go, you know, and go for something bigger, figure out what your true passions are, your true gifts and skills are and using those to your advantage. Those are that. That was beautiful. I, I don't even know how we even, even go to anywhere else from there. But Camo, it, it's been an honor, a privilege, a pleasure, all of that. Where could the people find you? Where could they, they connect with you? All that good stuff. Uh, give me the social media website, whatever you want to give, drop it right now. Yes. Yes. So if I don't say something about design and build, Shola will kill me. Cause she told me like, make sure you talk <laughs> about the and if you're I mean, you said something on the social media, like, damn, I talked about trap house the whole time. Trap house is, you know, www.trep.house. Um, 
venture development, startup studio side of things for black and brown founders. And then we have a shipping container development and construction firm that we launched out of the Trap House startup studio side of things as the very first venture. And we're at the point where, like, you know, we have a nine man team. You know, we're about to get a contract to enter into our first building. We have our first conceptual design project. Um, we're about to get a 30 container project um, and just really take it from there and hit this whole Midwest up. Nice. I mean, that's DTB Delta Tango Bravo firm dot com. Um, so shipping container development, construction and venture development. So I'm all about business development and real estate development. Those are the two things I feel like we have to chain to shift our whole situation. And we have to think of creative ways to do it. So I'm looking at the most. Uh, efficient and effective ways to do so. Nice, nice, nice. I love it. I love it. Um, I'm also going to get your bio and all, all that information from you as well so I could put it on, on the site for the people. Thank you again for your time. Appreciate you, brother. It's a, a honor and a blessing. And, um, I, I, you know, I'm gonna have to have you on here again when, uh, you know, COVID is done so we can do an in person thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, let me know because I've never been to San Diego, man, but I hear the weather is always dope. Oh, it's man. beautiful out here. So, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll come up there and vi- visit your neck of the woods too, just to see what the, what the town and city is like. <laughs> that energy you're gonna bring with you, man. You know, it's honor and pleasure on my end, man. And we really need that those different ways of thinking that a more expansive thought to come into these little tiny cities, man, to really push that boundary, man. So anytime you're welcome, brother. Absolutely. Absolutely. This has been an episode with uh, Cabo from Trap House. Peace.